In this screencast, we're just going to introduce cells as the basic unit of structure and function of all living things. Uh, in another screencast, you'll, we'll take a look at all of the parts and the significance of all the specialization that goes on. We'll just have a, a basic understanding of what cells are and what they mean to biology. Just a couple things we want to touch upon here are a couple key concepts that, first of all, cells, cells provide compartments. They provide compartments for biochemical reactions. What that means is that within living things, even if they're single cellular or multicellular, they provide compartments that are going to kind of house and box in these macromolecules, including the four that we talked about, including enzymes, so that enzymes and substrates can be in close proximity to one another, so that these biochemical reactions that are important to life can actually take place. And we're going to talk about prokaryotic cells and compare them to eukaryotic cells so that we know what the difference is. So there's probably some pretty complex uh, answers to this question here, but just simplistically, um, cells of all types show the same basic characteristics. They show the same type of cell parts, where some of them are just a little more specialized than others, depending on what the cell's job is in a in a multicellular organism, or what its job is as part of a um, as part of an environment if it's a single-celled organism. The cell theory states that these three fundamental things to be true. Uh, it's the was the first unifying theory of all biology, and of course, when you see this word theory, I don't think anybody is going to dis refute the cell theory. Just remember that a theory is an endpoint in science. It's just a huge, vast collection of information and data and empirical knowledge by, collected by a scientific nature. But the first one is that cells are the fundamental units of life. They're the fundamental units of structure and of function of all living things. All organisms are composed of cells. So again, it's the, it's, is the structural component and building block of all living things. And all cells come from pre-existing cells. If you want a new cell, very simplistically, the cells simply divide. A, a process that we'll talk about down the road in great detail. Uh, back to the fact that cells provide compartments for these complex pathways to take place, these chemical reactions to take place. We're going to look at this characteristic or this idea of a surface area to volume ratio for cells um, in a lab, but we want to define a couple things and state and, and introduce it here. The volume of a cell determines its metabolic activity relative to time. So over time, how much volume or how much inside of the cell, that's going to determine what type of chemical reactions and what metabolic activity can actually take place. The surface area, on the other hand, the area, the size of the membrane or the size of the surface of the cell is going to determine what can actually enter and leave the cell. So what that leads to is looking at why cells are so small, except for, well, a few exceptions that maybe you're aware of. Cells are very, very small. In fact, they're microscopic. But really, it's the surface area to volume ratio that determines why it has to be so small. The surface to volume ratio, as you look, as you get a smaller cube here, just using a, a, you know, a bunch of right angles and a cube size or shape for us to look at, the surface area to volume ratio is going to remain relatively large. And the reason that's good is you increase the cell size or even the figure size here, the surface area the surface area will increase, but the volume increases at a huge rate. So this is very important. As an object increases in volume, its surface area, of course, also increases, but not as quickly. So in other words, the volume and the, and the needs of the meta, metabolic activity inside the cell will increase so quickly that the surface area just can't keep up. And it's like, that's like having a company 
a manufacturing company expand and get so big, but yet it only still has a couple of uh, shipping and receiving docks. They just can't keep up with the volume. Think about Target Field or the old Metrodome or, or TCF Bank Stadium. If those big, huge stadiums only had one or two doors, like your classroom would have a door, it just wouldn't be able to keep up with the volume of activity going on inside. One small door is okay in your classroom, but the small door on a huge venue like that, it just can't service the volume. We'll look at this idea uh, up close and personal in lab. One of the things that we can do to, to explore and study the composition of cells is um, to chemically an analyze what's actually in the cells, what makes them up. And to do that, we have to break them down. It's called a free, uh, cell-free extract. And so it's really this simplistic. Put them in a blender, and then that extract goes into a test tube that we can centrifuge. And by centrifuge, this will separate into its component parts. Um, and then we can chemically analyze that to find out what the properties of the cell. And we, would, uh, we can then infer that those properties are going to be the same as what would be happening inside of the cell. We used essentially this method to, to break down the cells to extract or get the access to the enzymes when we did the enzyme lab. There are two main types of cells called prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. So prokaryotes are typically more simplistic. They're more primitive cells than eukaryotes. Prokaryotes, they don't have membraned enclosed parts. So in other words, they don't have specific organelles. Uh, eukaryotes have organelles, uh, such as the ones that you've studied. In a eukaryotic cell, the DNA, the genetic material, is going to be housed and compartmentalized in a nucleus, in a membrane-bound compartment. In a prokaryote, the DNA is essentially called free-floating. It's not in a membrane-bound compartment. So characteristics of the prokaryotic cells, uh, they're enclosed in a plasma membrane. So they have a cell membrane, just like any cell does, but the DNA is located in what is called a nucleoid, which is kind of roughly means kind of a nucleus, but not really. It's not a membrane-bound uh, compartment like the nucleus is. The cytoplasm consists of, just like in eukaryotic cells, a cytosol, and then the ribosomes and the other structures that are essentially dissolved in solution in the cytosol. So here you have a look at the parts of a prokaryotic cell and not all of these do you have to know or be able to identify especially the specific parts of the cell wall the layers of that but depending on the type of prokaryotic cell that it is it may have a varying uh, complexity to it eukaryotic cells have the same plasma membrane they have cytoplasm and they have ribosomes but they also have what sets them apart are membrane enclosed compartments called organelles each one of these plays a specific role in cell functioning and an evolutionary or a complexity characteristic of that fact that they have organelles remember is that what that does is it allows specialization of chemical reactions to take place. If parts are compartmentalized, that's going to bring, for instance, substrates and enzymes in closer proximity, increasing the likelihood that they're going to form a relationship, form a bond, and therefore carry out chemical reactions. Probably the main organelle that sets prokaryotes and eukaryotes apart is the, is the existence of a nucleus. So in eukaryotic cells, the nucleus is a membrane compartment set apart from the rest of the cell. But the main thing about that is like it's the brain. It's the, it's the central organelle of the cell itself. Contains the DNA, the deoxyribonucleic acid. So in other words, the blueprints for its life, for its function, for all the, making all the structures in the cell. And it's the site where DNA is transcribed to RNA. That we will study in more depth down the road. It also contains a nucleolus. That's where these ribosomes that we've talked about are assembled from 
RNA, another nucleic acid, and from proteins. The nuclear membrane is otherwise known as the nucle nuclear envelope. It has pores that control what moves into the nucleus and what moves out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. So in the nucleus, DNA combines with proteins to form chromatin and at times, just before cell reproduction, that chromatin is organized into what are called chromosomes. For now, we can just kind of lump all this together as a way to distinguish or to talk about the genetic material of a cell. So here is a artist picture of an animal cell. Again, remember that one artist's picture is different from the other artist's picture is different from an actual photomicrograph, a picture of an actual cell. Um, and you need to familiarize yourself with the structures and the, and the basic look of these organelles so that you can, you can identify these structures across any drawing or picture that you see. The same thing goes for this. This is a, a plant cell. Remember that plant cells and animal cells have most all of the same organelles and structures. They just have a few distinguishing characteristics.